Hi, I'm going to keep this one brief because it wasn't really a planned video and it's it's a very depressing subject but I've always taken an approach on this channel um, that nothing really is uh, off bounds and even if I'm a voice in the in the sea it's um, these are things that have to be said so one of the main narratives that um, the Kremlin has used throughout this war throughout this invasion of Ukraine is this repeated, repeated, repeated um, mantra of taking on Ukrainian fascists and Nazis and they use the terms interchangeably. Um, it's one of the justifications for the invasion to liberate Ukraine from Nazis. Um, now, what's interesting is even Russian Ukrainians, that is, uh, Russians living in Ukraine and perhaps people with one parent who's Russian, people with uh, Russian descent. Um, because there will be a lot in Ukraine, there's, you know, that's no mystery. Even they have um, rejected the, the Kremlin's attitude that it's somehow fighting for them. Um, it's true there will be Russian loyalists in Donetsk and Luhansk. But um, I question how uh, how significant they really are, because if there was mass support for Russia within Ukraine, you know, wouldn't the Ukrainians have welcomed the Russian liberators with open arms um, and overthrown the supposedly fascist government of Zelensky? Um, the fact he's Jewish uh, seems to go out the window. Um, Sergei Lavrov claimed that Hitler had Jewish um, ancestry. There, there's some possibility of that, but he was saying it as a way of sort of vindicating, well, it doesn't matter if the president's Jewish. Um, okay, well, is that suggesting that Zelensky employs Nazis or what? Um, Holocaust survivors have spoken out against Russia's invasion of Ukraine. But I've just seen a report... Um, CNN, uh, an interview with a woman who was captured at Mariupol. Now, she was a volunteer medic. Medic. She wasn't a soldier. She wasn't um, a combatant of any kind. She was a medic. She was captured by the Russians, held for weeks. Actually, I believe it was two months. Um, this was after Mariupol was first attacked, I believe. Um, she endured prolonged, basically, torture. She was psychologically tortured. She was repeatedly called a Nazi, um, subjected to show trials, physically beaten. Um, that's what these Russian thugs are doing. They contrast that to Russian prisoners in Ukrainian hands who have been given due process. They haven't been beaten. Um, it, it's just a contrast. In fact, early in the war, Ukrainians were even giving young Russian soldiers phones to contact their families, giving them food. This is hardly a fascist people. And of course, um, you know, there will be people with a vested interest. They will find fascists in Ukraine. They will find neo-Nazis. Um, there were remnants of the Azov Battalion, for example. Now it's a bit more uh, diverse in its makeup, but certainly the Azov Battalion had a questionable background. I'm not going to deny that. My point would be, in any country, you have far-right elements. So picking out neo-Nazis in Ukraine and saying this is the Ukrainian nation is just extreme. It's a vilification of an entire country, a country of over 40 million people. I mean, Russia's got just as much of a far-right problem, um, certainly in the 90s. And I would say well into the 21st century, it's been a problem in big Russian cities like Moscow and St. Petersburg of skinhead gangs going around looking for dark-skinned people to beat up, often from the Central Asian republics because they're darker skinned or they have more oriental features. Um, Russia really has is in no position to be lecturing about fascism. And I would argue, most of all, the, the behaviour of the Putin regime is absolutely fascistic. I mean, when you think about it, in the late 30s, uh, what the Third Reich done was, particularly with the Sudetenland, they justified their annexation uh, on the ground to were protecting German speakers. Now, how is that any different to what Russia is doing now, claiming that they're protecting Russian speakers? 
or rather what they have been doing since 2014. Even if you argue that uh, there's a majority in those regions that choose to be in Russia, does that justify the absolute brutal brutalization of a nation? Does that justify deliberately targeting civilians and absurdly, baselessly claiming the Ukrainians are doing it themselves? I mean, what sort of sick, distorted worldview must you have to seriously argue that the Ukrainian military and the Ukrainian government will be shelling women and children who are Ukrainians just to make the Russians look bad? Shelling hospitals, shelling a shopping mall. And with each day that goes by, there's another example of brutality. It's just so, so sickening. It's frightening, but it's also sickening. Now, Ukraine, of course, is not the only war zone in the world right now. Um, I heard this morning about another massacre in Ethiopia, in the Amara region, um, rather the Aromia region. So um, it's important to remember Ukraine isn't the only war zone in the world right now. And the various ethnic conflicts in Ethiopia are just as violent. Um, and overall have killed more people, but most likely. But um, one issue of Ethiopia is it's very difficult for journalists to access. The government of Abe Ahmed has uh, restricted media access. He's complained that the media has portrayed the Ethiopian side in a negative light. But they have not allowed transparency for journalists. If journalists can't do the job, they can't reasonably be expected to show the whole story as they literally can't they can do the best they can but um, by interviewing different sources and so on but um and and there's there's plenty of other trouble spots around the world um afghanistan is far from um uh peaceful i mean it's far from placid at the moment um west africa the various insurgencies going on there um mali burkina faso nigeria um, but the thing with Ukraine is because it directly involves a superpower or a near be superpower in Russia, the world's biggest nuclear power for sure, a power that has threatened the stability of a continent, um, it, it is particularly important. Um, also, the fact that the grain supply, this issue of grain, is extremely important. So, actually, the implications go well, well beyond Ukraine in that sense. I have noticed a lot of Africans, uh, I mean Nigerians, Tanzanians, Kenyans and so on, for some bizarre reason, um, joining social media or getting into these threads and saying they hope Putin succeeds and other such nonsense. I can't rationalise that. I don't know if it's some sort of animosity towards Ukrainians or what, but it's bizarre because Russia hardly has benevolent interests in Africa. The antics of the Wagner Division, for example, or Wagner Division, um, curiously named, sounds more Germanic, but, um, you know, mercenaries in Mali and so on. Um, I, I believe, I believe Putin's regime is evil, and I think it's been responsible for so much pain in the world. I mean, throughout the Syria war, they propped up the Assad dictatorship, um, which was committing heinous heinous acts, um, just as bad as anything going on in Ukraine, you know, dropping barrel bombs on children. And um, I'm going to round this up because I've mentioned all these issues before. But when I when I think of Westerners in particular, you know, Russian nationalists I expect it from them because they're, they are what they are. They're, they're nationalistic. They will, they're dogmatic about it. They will fight to the death for the motherland. Um, but when I see Westerners going out of the way to defend Putin and Putinism, I honestly want to vomit. I honestly want to vomit because they think that they're being smart. Oh, I don't listen to mainstream media. Oh, so you believe RT instead. Ugh, these people are, I'd like to give them the benefit of the doubt and say they're just plain ignorant. But I think it's worse than that. I think they know. I think they know what Russia's doing in Ukraine, but it might be that they've been spouting off uh, about their support for Russia and they want to save face by not admitting they were wrong. But I, I just don't, I, I'm not even going to try and get into their mindset. 
then you get people um, who kind of pretend to be neutral, but they have some very, very dubious positions. Uh, I would mention someone like Kim Iverson. I've mentioned her a few times. I'm not picking on her. There's other examples, but just as an example, you know, her posts on the Hill on the subject of the Ukraine war, she sort of veins this neutrality. But she will come out with these sort of sarcastic conspiracy theories about NATO and the West. And she won't have a damn thing to say about Russia. Instead, she'll just quote Russia. Oh, and I'm just a messenger, don't shoot me. But um, she's failing as a journalist by failing to scrutinise Russia and failing to scrutinise Russian claims. I mean, when the atrocities were happening at Bucha and Kramatorsk, she was simply regurgitating the Russian line. She wasn't saying this cannot be proven or um, Russia has been known to, um, Russia has been proven to make up statements such as the special military operation and there would be no invasion of Ukraine and that's precisely what happened. So my simple question for those useful idiots and Putin stooges is how do you explain that? You know, for weeks Russia said they wouldn't invade and that is exactly what they've done. So even in your distorted, sick worldview, if you think Russia is right, how the hell do you explain that? How do you explain that lie? How, how, how can you deny it? It's like this cognitive dishonesty that they have um, and it's pathetic. But like I say, this is going to take generations really for... Um, for any sort of reconciliation, because if you've been tortured for two months, the psychological effect of that um, will last for a very long time. I can only imagine what it's like. I've never been through it, but I can imagine what it's like. I would say the the anxiety, the mental anguish um, must be awful. Um, and it's just pure evil what these Russians are doing. I think Russian troops in Ukraine may also be desensitized in a similar way to the way American troops were in Vietnam. So I think they're sort of desensitized because they've been brainwashed that they're doing the right thing. And they've been sort of programmed to believe that the Ukrainians are Nazis. Oh, well, we're only hurting Nazis. They're bad people. So it doesn't matter what we do to them. This is an extremely dangerous thing. Um, it's just pure evil. That's why I... I so, so hope that Ukraine prevails. It's why the one, one risk is war fatigue. That is, the way the news cycle works is, you know, when this invasion happened, it was a huge story, understandably. People were talking about it. It was a huge thing. There was solidarity for Ukraine, and I think there still is. But then people will turn on the news and say, oh, Ukraine, the war there, what's new? And that's a danger, particularly if it, permeates to political level because then people kind of resonate to the fact that, well, it's just the Russians and Ukrainians fighting and they forget that actually if it spreads beyond Ukraine, um, it, it's, it's directly threatening a whole continent. So I don't think, I think there, there shouldn't be complacency about this. Um, the war is very much raging on. People are suffering every day. Russian brutality continues every day. Um, I try to avoid, incidentally, pro-Putin people because they just sicken me so much and I don't trust myself to lose my rag, quite honestly. Getting back to that video I was speaking about, how you can't be friends with everyone, well, this is a good example. I could not be amicable to someone condoning what Russia's doing right now. More likely, I'll just avoid them. Because I honestly wouldn't trust myself not to lose my rag because I just think it is so, um, just so, uh, messed up. Ukraine has to prevail. Just has to. Thanks for watching.